Hey. Yeah, we're recording. Wednesday, January 29th, we're going to get into a bit more mythology types things to help you out from there. Stuff behind me. Honor Society kids, if you're at home seeing this, I am not pushing you to turn it in until Monday. I'm not going to harass you for tomorrow or Friday. I'd much rather you work on the book report checkpoint and make it a bit low, low, low stress. If you turn it in Monday, I will consider that a win and I will be happy uh, not trying to trick you or anything like that. Book report checkpoint number two coming up on Friday. And then, I think that's why I did that. Secret War speeches tomorrow. No more NWA unless you're not done. Or torturing kids if their notebooks were not open and not working like they're supposed to be, making a teacher hurt. No, I'm only yelling at one kid. And although the rest of you could probably learn from me torturing her. Diddy! Um, you forgot to say the sign that um, Zeus is a big fat cheater. He is not a cheater. He's friendly, and we're going to get to that. Oh. He cheated on his sister. <laughs> That's why right. right. yeah. I got to know that. If you thought that was weird, just wait. Uh, anyway, so with <clears throat> starting the secret word speech number two tomorrow, now that I've explained to you the continuing of the story, the challenges that go into it, the losing, uh, or sorry, the ands, ums, and likes, having to pause, the reason being is that I introduce your first speech for a big grade next week. And by big grade, it's like a 30-point grade for your speech, where you have to like actually do research and know what you're going into and planning it ahead. It's like a real speechy speech thing. And so every time in that speech that you say and, um, or like, it charges you a point off of your grade. And so to help get you ready for that, that's why we're doing our little secret word speeches to try and get you there. Some of you want to make sure in your Honor Society essays, make sure you put a part in there about how you distract people during class and try to focus on the good choices so they don't come back to haunt you. Anyway, sorry, I got distracted. Much me. Um, with the speech coming up next week, what I wanted to do was give you a short story about me. Because I've realized in discussions with kids that for some reason you seem to think the version of me that you see in front of you is the version of me that always existed. And that me in junior high was probably just like this, but just shorter and probably more hair and slightly less facial hair, but was just as outgoing and friendly in everything you see. Which is not the way it was at all. Junior high me was the exact opposite. Junior high me was the shy, quiet kid that sat in the back of the room and tried to talk as little as possible and was not good at interacting with other humans at all. This version of me did not come until much later in high school, but it's a story I tell you at the end of the year. The reason I tell you that is because I have kids who complain about giving speeches. And they're like, Mr. Broviak, you understand, you've always been good at talking, you don't understand what's likely bad at speeches. To which I reply, ha! No, speeches were awful for me when I was a kid, so much so that there are two I remember giving that were so horrifying, they haunt me to this day. So allow me to horrify you. The first speech, now I know I gave more than two, it's just that there are two that still haunt me till now. The first one was in seventh grade. In seventh grade, I was in a math class, uh, and in my uh, math class, we had to give a speech. Because apparently God decided the only thing that makes math worse is having to give a speech in math. And so we had to get and to make it triple worse, it was the week before winter break that we had to give this speech. And so it was right before break, and we had to research a job connected to math. We had to go down to the library, we got to use a little research stuff, we got to pick any job we wanted as long as we could just connect it to math and explain how it used math in that particular career. And I was excited because I found a job called actuary. And an actuary, I thought, was a lawyer. And so I was stoked because I thought being a lawyer would be really fun and it'd be an easy speech to do. So I grabbed actuary and I signed up for it and I flexed on the other kids because no one else could take that particular career. And then I researched what an actuary was. And an actuary is not a lawyer. I was thinking of the word attorney which is a completely different thing. An actuary is like an accountant. An accountant is the person that works at H&R Block and does your taxes. Except an actuary is the boring version of that. I thought accountant was already boring. Exactly. So that's what I got to give my speech about. So I was not super stoked about giving a speech in a class I did not like about a topic I did not enjoy. So, plus, I didn't like talking in general. 
So as we got closer to the day of the speech, I was freaking out, nervous, practicing at home, not doing well. Mama and Papa me loved me. And so the day of my speech arrived, and my mom decides to try and cheer me up that morning, the day of school. And so she knew I'd been practicing and freaking out. She goes, "Hun, I think I have a way of trying to relieve your anxiety. And I was like, what's up? She goes, how about we give you an early Christmas present? And I said, yeah, that's definitely going to help. I'm never going to turn down an early Christmas present. Bring it on. So she did. And it turns out what her early Christmas present was, was an outfit that she had bought for me for Christmas. And she wanted to give it to me that day so I could wait. So apparently your parents have given you the gifts of outfits as a teenager also. So she wanted to give me this outfit so I could wear it. You do realize that just charges your points because you're not working and you're putting your hand on there and you're making me be mean to you. Stop making me torture you, child. I don't have any more. I don't know where my people is. One, I'm going to scoot you over to there so I'll have to charge you more points. And then two, you can always just make it up. Or three, that's fine. So my mom gives me an outfit to wear that morning to try and help boost my confidence on that day. And so the outfit that she gave me was a shirt and a sweater. Uh, the shirt was a fairly normal looking shirt. It was a button up shirt, sort of like the one I'm wearing, but it was tan and had like these weird stripy things, had like a big collar going to it. Uh, and then the sweater was not a normal sweater. It was what's called a cardigan. Uh, and a cardigan is the one that goes like over the shoulders and that comes down into a V uh, and it has like buttons in the front of it. Uh, and so this was a large brown cardigan and it had large brown buttons, sort of like you would call old man buttons all down the front of it. Plus, as my mom explained to me at the time, kids like things baggy. So she bought me one that was three times too big. So I essentially looked like an old man who'd been hit by a shrink ray and was trying to wear his old clothes. But I didn't have the heart to tell my mother that this was a horrifying outfit that she was making me wear. So I put it on. I went, oh my God, in the mirror. And my mom was so excited. She's like, you look so adorable. You're going to do so great at your speech that I had to go to school because... She walked me outside to give me a hug and then sent me on my way. There was nowhere to change clothes. So I went to school wearing that and had to give a speech wearing that outfit, which technically did help because, in this odd way, I was so focused on how horrifying I looked that I wasn't even thinking about the speech. And I don't remember giving the speech. It's weird how memory works. I remember walking up to the podium and I can still to this day remember looking down at my outfit just going, oh God. And then like blackness. Like I don't remember anything after that. I, I know I lived because I'm still here now, but it was just a horrifying experience after that. And it got done and I was convinced that was the worst moment of my life and no speech could ever be worse. And then you became a teacher. And then <laughs> two years later, freshman year. So now I'm a freshman ninth grade in high school. I got bumped up to advanced English my freshman year. I was in regular all throughout junior high. Uh, and then freshman year I did like some tests and the teacher's like, you're smart. And I'm like, whatever. And they pushed me into advanced English, but I did not feel like I fit at all. So I'm sitting in this ninth grade class with all these kids who'd been in classes together forever and they all seemed super duper smart. And I was just trying to figure out what was going on and do my best to pretend like I was smart. And to make things even worse to me not fitting in, we had to give a speech at the beginning of the year. It was like in the first nine weeks, we had to give a persuasive speech where we had to go do a research a topic and we gave a speech where you have to convince the class to believe whatever it is you were talking about. And this time I learned from seventh grade. I decided that I was not going to do like a bad topic. I had to make sure I find a topic that I really believed in. So I did my research and I found what I put my heart into, which was animal testing. And the fact that I said that we should not do animal testing. The idea that excuse me, uh, like makeup, the test makes sure it like, doesn't hurt your eyes. They literally open up rabbit eyes, smear makeup on the rabbit's eyes, and then wait to see what kind of infection sets in. And so I was like, that's horrifying. I can easily convince people of this. So I chose animal testing, did my research, wrote my note cards, and I was prepared. Day of speech occurs. And so I'm all set. But my teacher loved us, so we could actually like, stand behind a podium and have note cards and stuff like that, unlike your teacher who hates children. And so I had my note cards, and I was all set. But here's the thing. In that class, there was a girl I had a crush on, a girl by the name of Joanna. Still remember to this day. 
Joanna sat in the front row, roughly where Amblin is right there. So I knew when I was going to give the speech, like I was going to be giving the speech to her and the rest of the class. In my mind, I had built this up because I had practiced this speech. I knew what I was going to do, that I was going to blow the class away. And I was convinced that when I finished this speech, she was going to be so impressed that I was going to ask her out and that we were like going to go to a dance that was coming up and stuff like that. And she was going to be like, oh my God, your speech is so good. We should be together forever. And I was be like, oh no. And so in my little brain, I was so hyped for it. Keep that in mind. So... <laughs> My speech time comes. I come up to the front of the class. I have my little note cards. And I low-key keep looking at Joanna. I'm just like, Ahem. Okay. And so I go, I go into speech. Things are going pretty well. I'm not the expert speakist. I am now. But at the time, it was like one of my stronger, strong, words are hard, stronger speeches I was doing. Um, but I got halfway through it. And two things happened. And I remember them to this day. So, one, um, I remember the exact part of the speech I was in. I was talking about veal. Uh, and veal parmesan, or veal anything, is the type of steak that you can buy. It's super expensive at really fancy restaurants. And the way you make veal is horrifying. You take a cow, when it's first born, pops out of mama cow. And you take that cow, and then you stick it into a cage that is smaller than the cow is tall. So it can never stand up. It is always forever half to lay down. And it has a giant feeder tube, like you give to like rats or guinea pigs. And that thing can, the cow can sit there and eat. And the feeder tube is full of protein and fat. And what it makes is this cow eats so much, it becomes a giant cow balloon. They literally cannot support their own weight because they never exercise, they have no muscle, and all they have is all of this delicious meat. It makes delicious meat super expensive, super cruel to the cow. That was the part of the speech I was in. Got to that part of it, making my eye contact, looking around, nailing all the parts. Look at Joanna. As I look at her, she yawns. But it's not a little yawn. It's a kind of yawn like she's committing to it and I realized not only am I so adorably awesome at this speech I'm boring her and not a little boring apparently she's fighting sleep kind of boring which is the complete opposite of what I built up in my head so because of that it broke me and so I got flustered and when I got flustered I misshuffled my cards that I had set up and I remember going to my next card, and it wasn't the right one. So then I didn't know what to do. So I did the natural thing. I started crying. Because apparently, that's what you do when your crush yawns and you're freaking out. And I still remember, to this day, standing in front of my class, getting flustered at that part, and realizing that I didn't know what to do next, and crying, and then trying to talk myself through it. Just going, you're crying. Dude, push through. You're stronger than this. Just go through. And so I just started pushing through as best I could. And I realized I had two options at this moment. Option one, scream, run from the room, and just drop out of school. Or option two, push through it, and maybe the class didn't notice. I went with option two. So I pushed through. And I'm talking about these cows that are put in little cages, and they have a feeder tube, and it's a horrible thing to do. And I'm pushing through this speech as best I can, and the class goes quiet. <laughs> and I'm just, I, I'm convincing myself as I get to the end of it, I'm like, well, you, you're fine. I'm like, they're quiet because they're paying attention to you. Maybe there's a chance no one's noticed. And so I get to the end of it, I'm like, and that's why... You should not use testing on animals because it's, a, it's an incredibly mean thing to do to them. Thank you. And I went from there, and I walked straight back to my seat, and I just sat down, and I just stared at my desk. And I was like, maybe no one's noticed, and it's all in your head. Class is quiet. There is not a sound. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, you have to look up eventually. 
So I had two friends, John and Matt, who sat to my right. So I did a low-key look over to my right, and they're both just staring at me <laughs> the whole time. And I'm like, oh God, they know. And so I just look back down, and then John, my friend, sitting next to me, just goes, oh my God. And I went, uh-huh. He goes, how am I supposed to follow that? And I went, what? He went, that was amazing. How am I supposed to follow that when you have that much emotion? Moment? I barely even care about my topic. And I went, what now? <laughs> Apparently, uh, he, the rest of the class, and most importantly, my teacher, uh, were convinced as she wrote in my paper that I was emotionally invested in my topic to a degree that she had not seen before. So I got, an, I got an A on that speech. Uh, and I did not tell anyone the reason why I cried was because the girl I had a crush on yawned. I had planned on taking that story to the grave with me because it was brought up all throughout the rest of high school. Anytime that I was in a class and that we got ready to give speeches, they'd all look at me like, oh, Broby is going to give his speech next. We're going to do cry and put us all to shame. And I'm like, ha, 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 yeah. Because that was not why I cried. And so it wasn't until years later as a teacher and I got, because I didn't have to use speech, you know, like the first several years of teaching. It wasn't until like seven, eight years into teaching that we were told we had to do speeches. And I just switched my whole curriculum. And I had a kid one day who was like, Mr. Brody, I can't give a speech. I'm like, you'll be fine. I'm like, what's the worst that happens? He's like, I'm going to cry. And I'm like, Psh, so what? You cry. And he was like, you don't understand. And I went, well, <laughs> actually, I do. And so I told them that story. I'm like, are you serious? I'm like, Yes, I'm serious, because I wish I wasn't, because then I could scrub that horrible memory from my brain, but I cannot. So I will tell you, when you give your speech and you fear that the worst possible thing can happen to you, no matter how bad that thing may be, the chances of it being worse than me weeping openly in front of my classmates because my crush yawned is incredibly unlikely. So when you finish your speech, at the very least, you can do is look over at me and just go, <laughs> I did better than you. Uh, and that should be your inspiration to try and get you through things. Have I ever had a kid cry? Yes. Two years ago was the worst I'd ever had. It was a girl in my fourth period advanced class. She is a freshman this year, Ava, who I am friends with on social media. She is an awesome kid. And I had to not see it coming. She raised her hand in class, had no problem like every time. She was like that verbal, outgoing kid. And then we, and she was in the honor side even too. But we got to the time of speeches and we did the secret word speech. And she stood up on the chair, begins her speech, and gets about 10 seconds into it. And then just starts crying. Just weeping right there in front of all of us. And freaked me out. And then she just like stopped. She's like, I need a minute. It's like, fine. She's down the hallway. Came back the next time. Started again. Cried. Did this every speech moving forward through the whole rest of the speech unit to the point where we just got used to it. Ava would go up there and she would just cry. So then once again, no matter how bad yours is, hopefully it's better than that. Tomorrow, not Greek myth. Hi, kid getting up trying to walk. Up. What are we doing tomorrow? And what are we doing on Friday? It's literally written right there. And one of you is going to bring me a gift tomorrow so I get to be nice to